Hey there, everybody. Welcome to season two, episode nine of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Heidson, and with Darren McAnthony, chairman and co owner of Peter United. Um, we were just talking before we came on mic there. It wasn't a great weekend for football, was it? Well, it wasn't a great weekend for any of my teams. Let me see. Posh, obviously, from the 60th minute onwards, fucking collapsed. Um, Ryder Cup, Europe put up the most feeble attempt to win the Ryder Cup. Uh, pathetic. Um, my Liverpool fucking made Brentford look like fuck, as good as Brentford are. Our defending was fucking abysmal. Uh, in a 3-3 game, we should have actually fucking never drawn. Um, my Tampa Bay Buccaneers fucking got beaten by the Rams yesterday and my beloved Patriots are just a pile of shit. The worst team in the NFL. Um, I don't know, and, I can and, give you some uh, and, and, Detroit Lions person so I can and, uh, push you car on that one. Me. They, they managed to lose to a 65-yard field goal. Fucking yeah. astonishing. And then obviously Anthony Joshua, you know what I mean? Fucking mm. obviously got schooled in boxing on Saturday. So from a perspective of all the teams I naturally support or be behind, we, it was a clean... Sweet Grand Slam, fucking disaster sports weekend. So I am, um, and to be fair, football wise, I didn't bar Liverpool and Posh. I didn't even look at any of the results until today. I kind of like, you know, which is odd because I used to obsess over results and statistics and other games and other leagues. And first time today, I've looked at league tables and League Two and League One only because of this show. You know what I mean? I wanted to, I wanted to have all the intel, but yeah, fucking disastrous. And then trying to get my scouts to games, they can't get petrol in their fucking cars. Even Barry. Baz rang me on Friday night and he was freewheeling fucking home from Coventry, I think on fumes. And he, I was saying to him, uh, I need you to go such and such tomorrow. And he's like, fucking chairman, I've got no petrol in the car. So I said, listen, the Barry Fry I know would have fucking booked an Uber. I wouldn't have been you'll bothered about a bit of petrol. Yeah, you'll find a way. I said, fuck it. But listen, I'll let you off this weekend. So yeah, so, um, yeah where do we start? And then obviously Bradford fucking, you know, losing yeah. to Crawley. Um, let's start with Posh. So we go to Coventry. I, I, I do like the Rico Arena. I'm glad they're back playing there. Um, good game. Really, really good game. And, and a real barometer of where you want to be in a year's time. Coventry, this time last year, were struggling. I think it was eight points in their first 10 games in the champ. And probably a bit like us, very naive, probably when they were first in the champ, conceding a lot of goals, doing all right, doing well at home. And a lot of similarities between our team. And you have to be, I'm not envious or jealous. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of Coventry, actually. You know, the steps they've taken as a, as a championship club. You know, they, they play good football. You know, the crowd was good. Our crowd, we had good fans there. And for an hour, you know, Coventry were the better team. There's no doubt about it. But we defended really well. We were fucking shocking in the final third. Every time we crossed the halfway line, it was fucking probably the worst I've seen us offensively. Um, but defensively, we dug in. We were clearing things off the line. We were, you know. And then they scored from our corner, by the way. We had the first corner of the fucking game. And they've gone down the other end and scored from our corner. And it's just like the biggest kick in the bollocks because, again, you know, we fold like a cheap suit inside eight minutes. You know, I think we're 3-0 down. And it's just like we – it's those same mistakes we've made now in four away games. We've lost five, but four of them where we've conceded quick goals, quick time. And our lads are getting a real roasting away from – I said it on Twitter, they were shit away from home. And I didn't mean that as a massive slight on our players or our management staff. We're just – we're not good away from home. Mm. And – our lads have to, I think our gaffer said after the game, some construed it as him questioning the player's character, but he wasn't. He was, what he was trying to say was, is that our boys know that they can play at this level. You don't smash Birmingham 3-0. You don't take Cardiff all the way. You don't take West Brom all the way, you know, unless you have some good football players. And even with all the issues going on, suspensions, injuries, you know, five strikers on the fucking sick bench, you know, we're a good football team. And what our players have to wake up and realise is, you can't go and do what you did against Birmingham and then show up against Coventry, play for 60 minutes, and then go under in eight, 10 minutes. Because in the championship, you're going to go behind. You're going to have to show re- resilience. And mm-hmm. last year, we were the no- number one team in the country from coming from behind. And this year, at the moment, we're probably the worst team for conceding straight away after we concede one. So our players, not questioning their character, they're going to have to dig deeper. You know, They're going to have to find a way away from home to dig in and go, go to places they haven't been. You know, yeah. we had a player. We had a player go off at half time because he was it. He was not feeling well. Well, suck it up, Buttercup. Um, you know, this is what it is. Unless you've got a broken fucking leg or you got a serious mm-hmm. issue, I couldn't give a fuck if you got an upset tummy. You know what I mean, or whatever it might be. You got to go out and help your teammates. And enough of that crap already, please. Like we need people like playing through the pain barrier. 
And, and I know some of these people I'm talking about are good players, but they're going to drop their balls now. And they've got to show a little bit of fucking resilience. And they've got to show a little bit of doggedness. And they've got to show that they belong. Because it's not just us and people. It's it's the outside world. Look at you as a player and look at you as players and go, are they mentally strong enough? Are they frail? Yeah. You know, teams are licking their lips. If they want to score against Posh, well, fuck me, score one, you're going to get two. So next time we can see the goal, chests need to go out. Balls need to be as big as fucking melons. And we've got to go, okay, fuck it. Now we've got to play and we've got to score a goal. And we've got to get back in the game. And... I've got the utmost confidence that our players will do that. They're, they've been dealt a lot of raw hands at the moment, or bad hands, you might say, with all the, the injuries, the issues. It's not just a knock here or there. It's broken arms, it's broken limbs, it's fucking knee injuries, it's, you know, ripped ties. It's, you, you know, you couldn't write the script. But that's the script that's been written. So what we have to do from that is uh, we have a squad, we have younger players, everyone has to step up. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, we're just a soft touch at the moment, away from home. Now, in saying that, we're a very good home team. And, of course, we've got, I think it's Bournemouth next, you know, at home. Um, great. Okay, you've got to play the best in the league at home, and you've got to, again, stick your chest out and show them that we're a good bloody team. You know, Blackpool five weeks ago, one of the worst teams in the championship, and they've had a nice little run, they got some clean sheets, and now they're suddenly 11th. That's this league. And our players have to, you know, realise you, you can be good at home, you can do what you do, and you know, long may that continue, they'll find a way away from home. And when you put it together, and they will, we'll be good. And a lot, and, and, and to be fair, a lot of the Coventry fans, there's big credit to them. They, you know, obviously I was getting a bit of hammering on Twitter. And a lot of the Coventry fans came on my Twitter account and were saying some very complimentary things. Sometimes it's a bit, you feel gutted. You say, oh, you played really well, but you got smashed three now. And, but what they were trying to say was, look, we were there a year ago. We look really good at home. We look really lousy away. And look at us now. We found our feet. Coventry went top of the champ on Friday night. You know, and, and, and it shows you there's a pathway, there's a way, there's a route. Uh, and Coventry are a really, really good football team. They play football really well. Robbins has, 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 has put to... When you think back, and you, you, we talk about Bradford, you think back Coventry got relegated to League Two. And in the five years since, they've won a trophy. They've come up from League Two to League One to the champ. They've now solidified themselves as a good top half championship side again you know again that's that's some i guess belief for you guys at bradford to believe that it can happen i you know just today i saw a league table five years ago uh league one at this point because it was showing us as being third i think in league one but i looked at the whole table and actually you look at scunthorpe top well they're not doing too handy bury were second we third northampton portville you know you look at what's happened in five years and on the bottom side was coventry bottom of the table there you go. So it just shows you they stuck behind Robbins. He's really good at what he does. I think he's got a really good setup there now. I know the owner gets a lot of slack, the lady who owns it, but I think that's been ignored because you've now got a really good football setup. They recruit well. They've got good players. They're similar to what we do. They're, they're young. They're hungry. They try and play and blend the football. You know, I saw a statistic yesterday. I think we like one of the best possession statistics of the weekend, but possession means diddly shit as we know. You could have 92% possession and get some fucking three nails. So, you know, your passing percentage can be really high. But again, if you're not doing things in all three areas of the game, you're going to lose the game of football. Um, so it was one of them frustrating. The most frustrating thing for me, losing the game of football, is not losing. I'm all right losing. It's it's when their goalkeeper can go on a cruise ship for fucking 90 minutes. And basically, like, I, I think it was the 89th or 90th minute when we had a fucking shot on goal. And for, that's, for me, unforgivable. For, for a PW United team, because we pride ourselves on, on trying to outscore the opposition. So it, we, we got to find that. Yeah, and you know, that's what I was thinking. And maybe I'm trying to make excuses as I'm thinking about this for sure. players too. And well, the way that you set up, you set up to attack, you know, mm -hmm. when you go away from home, maybe that's not the best setup. And so you've mm -hmm. got to take the losses because you get the wins at home and it would be too much disruption to keep changing your systems Correct. one week after the next because the way you're built but then you would expect to be seeing a little bit more up front. And, Correct. And am I just making excuses? Like no, 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 we, 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 no, no, our, no. Our, listen, our offensive players didn't exist on Friday night. With all due respect to the front three and then the midfielders behind them, they were they were poor. And I'll always call out our players when they're not good. And this isn't, I know Swanee's on holiday, so his deputy is now writing articles and he likes to be a little bit, because he's a young reporter, so he tries to get some headlines. This isn't me slating our players. This isn't me telling facts. We, as good as we were against Birmingham, we were really bad offensively against Coventry. And, and you know, we wouldn't have scored in a brothel with a million dollars in a bag next to us. 
So, you know, it was one of them nights where it was an off. But they've, they've, they've got to bounce back now. And we've got two big home games. We need two performances. And we need to go into the international break off the back of that and then figure out a way. We'll fix the away form, you know. Home form is going to, as I said this before, help us grow in the league. The away form will come. We've got to deal with all those issues we've got now with injuries and little niggles and things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of hard work ahead. But, again, you know, you take your licking. And I'm okay taking a licking occasionally. I just want us to, to kind of show a little bit of bollocks when we go behind. You know, if we get beaten by Coventry 2-1 and they have 20 shots or whatever else, okay, fine. But, you know, to the game, the game's over in eight minutes. It's eight minutes, you know. You, you get to an hour, you get a corner, and you think, fucking hell, we score here. We're 1-0 up. The crowd, the this, the whatever. They fucking go down and score. And then the game's over seven minutes later. But that can't happen. So that that's where the players have to look in the mirror now. And like fucking, and some of them are struggling for form away from home who are good players and they look a little bit rabbits in the headlights. Need to have a serious worry with themselves because they're better players than that. They're not, they're not as bad as those results are telling them they are. It's funny how the mind works, isn't it? You're talking about Bournemouth and yet, you know, you go into that Bournemouth game feeling that you're at home and you've got every chance of getting a result there. Well, always if you're going away to Bournemouth right now, you'd be thinking, oh crap, we're away at Bournemouth. And yeah. It's the same team you're playing. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I always fancy us. I know it's going to be a tough game, do you know what I mean, and whatever else. But I always fancy us at home. We are good at home. There's something about the players feel different, the more confidence, whatever it might be. But And we've been good for three years now at home. But, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I don't I don't go into any game going, oh, my God, we're playing Bournemouth. Oh, my God, we're playing Middlesbrough. Oh, my God, we're playing Fulham. You know, this is what we worked really hard for. Yeah. And I, and I need the players who are a bit glossy-eyed and some of those performances when conceding goals quickly to think about that, how hard we worked to get here. So, you, you know, you need to get your shit together. And, and, and that's what they need to do. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, look, everyone at the club needs to work harder. You know, when I speak to the gaffer, it's never about them, they. It's always we. We are not good away from home. We are really good at home. You know, we are growing into this. It's not you, 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 yeah, you. You're all in it together. Yeah, we are. We are. We are. We fucking are. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, listen, he was he was all right on Friday night. He was frustrated. You know what I mean? Because, again, it's like repeating the same things. And we're, we're real sticklers for don't make the same mistake twice. And we've done it four fucking times. So that's driving everybody to, like, to madness levels. Um, but, you know, I think they were in on Saturday. And then they're in again today studying some of the video. It would have been a horror show watching that. But there were a lot of good things in there as well, you know. And 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 like I said, I, I love this league, and I know our fans. I mean, fuck me, Almighty! It's so tiring some of the shit from some of the fans. You know what I mean, it's just like it's nonstop, and it's just uh, every time it's the same old crap when you lose. But you don't hear from those fucking wankers when you win, you know. And and, and I call them wankers politely, but they are wankers. You know what I mean? Because I, I hate somebody who is only there for the winning and never there for the losing. Do you know what I mean? Are, are only there for the losing and not there for the winning. Do you know what I mean? So be consistent. You know, criticize when it needs to be and praise when it's due. And you just don't get that from some people. But 99% of the fans are great and they fucking hammer those idiots down. And a few of the Coventry fans came to my defense on Twitter, you know, saying, my God, what do your fans expect? Like, they need to calm down some of these guys. But, you know, on we go. Wednesday night it is. And... Um, It'll be a real test of our players' fitness now this week, Wednesday, Saturday. You're not getting Tuesday, Saturday, so it's Wednesday, Saturday. And um, yeah, we need a, we need to get a we need to get some performances. Never mind the results; the results come with good performances. But yeah, I expect us to do better. You know, so talk to me about Bradford, Derek, who I listened to his press interview. You sent me. You did. Yeah, I, 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 he wasn't happy. Chappy. I laughed when that guy said to me, "I thought such and such came on and did really well." Did he? <laughs> right. This is like shit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things I was thinking as I hearing it. You know, <laughs> it's not the kind of um press conference you'd probably want to hear your manager giving. No. Um no. But yeah, no. we we lost last week to um uh, Man United under 21's reserves, mm. I think it was, um in the um what is it now? Papa John's trophy. Mm. And we didn't look too handy uh, in that defeat. And yeah, lost to Crawley, which was, you know, a performance that was probably as low as the low um, for last year. But, you know, we got five injuries or six injuries. Five of them are forward players. Um, <laughs> he's dealing with what he's got to deal with, just like you are. Yeah. Um, and um, but it wasn't a happy. We haven't won in seven now. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't like a manager talking about injuries over and over. You know, Mike Afro did occasionally, but you know, Friday night he didn't talk about injuries, and we 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 could have lost Dembele for a while. You know, he went down. I thought his knee had gone, and that was just me. I was I was under the desk on Friday night. I thought, well, that's 
you know, we now officially have no strikers yeah. available, you know. Um, but to be fair, you never want to hear a manager, you know, constantly going, oh, I heard your manager, Leanne Gold, and this player and that player and whatever else. Look, that's the hand you dealt. Yeah. So get on with it. Go get some wins. Find a way to win. Man City don't have really any strikers. They manage to stick five or six goals past people most of the time. Get on with it. Find a way. Because that's all you can do. I mean, mm-hmm. I was saying to our guy, for listen, we'll, we'll get the leading goals draw from the youth team to come up and play for the first team. He said, no, he broke his arm three days ago. I'm like, fucking great. <laughs> it's like, listen, you just got to find a way. Um, yeah. so, so was it that bad performance-wise? Again, it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't, you know, the, the performances up to now have been, we've talked a lot about plenty of entries into the final third and it yeah. looks like it's just a matter of being a little bit more creative. It was just one of those days when just nothing was happening. You know, and you just, it felt like, it's not that they weren't trying, because I would never say nobody's not trying. It just, there was something that wasn't happening and it wasn't connecting and they could still be playing now and we'd probably still have lost, you know. There just wasn't that fight. One of them games. um, You know, I think that they're just getting down now with, uh, I mean, it's always a place that's hard for us to go for whatever reason is Crawley. We're always awful down there. Yeah, I've lost Um, there a few times. (laughs) It's not nice. Um, And... It was, you just knew, like, it's time to pack up and go home. We weren't going to win here. But you're one, I checked the table, you're one win from automatic promotion. Isn't that the, I mean, that's the funny thing, right? I mean, here like, we are, what, eight and nine, nine, eight and nine games in, and yeah, it's not time to panic. No, I'm looking at the table going, okay, you're getting your rotten bit of luck, you know, with injuries, yeah. and sometimes, you know what, you can get them out of the way early, and, and you, you know, you, that's what I'm hoping with us, and yeah as you get towards that middle and back end of the season, everyone's available. Yeah, Other teams then have that. And everything. Right, that bad luck, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you're one win, you know what I mean? You, 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 you're three points from like third place or whatever it is, fourth place in League Two. So, it's not all that bad. That league's not going to get away from you. That mm. league's not going to be, you know, it's, I, I, I personally don't think, because you've always got, what was it, three automatically up, yeah. one in the playoffs. That league, like Bolton showed last year, isn't going to get away from you. So, <laughs> the last thing you need at your club is for your fans to go Harry Carry and start going after the owner or going after the manager or, you know, listen, stick with it. Do you know what I mean? We said this before, you know what I mean? You're going you're gonna to have to stick with it. This guy's, you know, you brought him in for a reason. He's just going to have to get him. But he's got to help himself and stop with the crap and like press interviews. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it was a little bit of blaming everybody else. Yeah. Um, but That's was- where Ryan, Ryan has to earn his money. Yeah. You know, Ryan, Ryan's got to ring him after that because that's my manager or whatever. I was running after going, listen, I understand we've got a few issues. I understand the injuries. I understand we didn't bring in Ronaldo on deadline day and get you the player or whatever else. However, that's not going to help. Mm-hmm. So cut the shit out and do your fucking job. Yeah, because now everyone's talking, well, is he going to walk? And yeah, I mean, yeah. all this stuff that obviously cut the shit out. Happen, no, of course just... not. Like, cut the shit out. Like, listen, you, you, you lose a football game, you lose a football game. Stop with the fucking nonsense. Stop with the blame. Stop with the distractions and get on with doing your fucking job. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, that's the reason why I wouldn't hire a guy. Do you know what I mean, I listen to mm-hmm. managers' interviews and whatever else and, you know, he's just going, oh, fucking, you know. So that's where Ryan's got to earn his fucking dough and you got to basically say to him, that can't happen again. So let's be in it together and let's get back to winning. Who are you playing yeah. next at home? Uh, Rochdale. Go on, Tuesday night. Uh, Saturday, I think we don't have a midweek oh, game. So. Well, there you go. Well, great. Rochdale aren't doing too great, are they? So that's a wonderful opportunity to fucking get back on the horse, right? You're going to have yeah. a, a full valley parade. You know what I mean? A big week of work. You maybe get an injury player back or two and get out there and fucking destroy Rochdale. That's what you got to do. And we got to help ourselves and not boo. I mean, that's one of the things that surprised me is the boo boys are already coming out. Yeah, uh, stop with that. That doesn't help anybody. We, we've all missed football as fans for so long. Um, you know, I was lucky I watched football because I owned a club so I could get in during COVID. And you've had fans who've missed it for like 16 months. So the idea after three, four home games, you're fucking booing again. Mm-hmm. Like, just remember the last 16 months. You know, and remember like if someone had said to you six months ago, look, you can get back into games, but you're not allowed to boo for five games. You'd have cut your right finger off to get in. Right. So, so, so you know, fans are so fickle sometimes. I mean, I, I guess we all are. In sports, you know what I mean? Like, I'll bitch and moan about Liverpool, I'll bitch and moan about whatever else. But that's, I guess that's just in us. That, that means mm-hmm. you're a real sports fan, I guess, right? <laughs> I guess you can't, you can't check the passion at the door. <laughs> no, no, you can't. <laughs> but I've never booed. I've never booed a team I've, I've followed or supported. Do you know what I mean? Like, never, ever. 
my whole life I've never booed. I might have moaned like fuck, but I didn't boo. Um, because I don't think that's that helps the manager, it helps the players. Yeah, not for me. So you had uh, Liverpool against um, Brentford. I mean, were you a? Did you have your Liverpool hat on that day, or did you have your Ivan Tony can is in the shop window uh, hat on? I wanted Liverpool to win five three, and Ivan to score three goals. Right. That would have been just perfect, you know. Now look, Brentford aren't an anomaly. This isn't this isn't an accident, by the way. This is a well run football club. This is a well put together team. This is, you know, Klopp said it himself. They got a goalkeeper who could play as a ten. They got three centre halves who are like seven foot fucking tall. You know, they got wing backs that are wingers, and then they got a front two who are like, you know, could be as good as anybody in the Premier League, including Ivan Tony. And what I think Liverpool fans realise is what I've been moaning about the last few years. Ivan Tony is a better player than Divock fucking Origi. He's a better player than Mini Moto or whatever on the bench. In other words, with Liverpool losing players up front, you and Ivan Tony in your team. He's he's a clock type player, in my opinion. Do you know what I mean? And Liverpool have been crying out for maybe that nine. They've, they've had Firmino playing there. They've got Jota playing in there. But they like to play a three, and they like the one in the middle, one off the right and the left. Ivan Tony would piece that together easily. He'd, he, for me, he would play in that Liverpool team and score 25 goals for fun. And he'd bring a physicality Liverpool don't have up front. Do you know what I mean? So, look, he's, he's money in the bank for me. Everything he's doing is no surprise, because you know I've been singing his praises for years. And, um, yeah. I'll be counting those dollars next summer when they sell them for 50 million. Because I tell you right now, if, if any of the top clubs are spending 50 million on a the striker, they want to be spending it on him because uh, he, he brings so much. But Brentford are very impressive. Look, Liverpool, typical Liverpool, so many chances. They waste so many chances. Salah, the 3 2 up, should have finished the game 4 2. He's in on goal and nonchalantly fucking flips it over the bar. And as good as Salah and Mane are on statistics, the numbers, fuck me, the chances they miss are just horrific. I mean, they do miss some chances, do you know what I mean? So that's a game where we shot ourselves in the foot um, because, you know, City obviously beat Chelsea. Um, Man United lose. It's a great opportunity to get a little two-point lead going at the top of the table. You know, you're going into the Man City game. You know, you win that game. You know, you could almost afford to lose to Man City, do you know what I mean? And now it's just like the pressure. And most worrying, I didn't think Virgil van Dijk was very good. I mean, that's probably the worst I've seen in play in a long time, whether that's the injury, whether it's whatever else. But no, the back four of Liverpool, every time a cross went in that box and their goalie, Liverpool's goalie was shit as well. Do you know what I mean? I think he only had four shots or five shots or whatever else. And, you know, three of them were on target. One of them was off the line. Um, but Matip, so our goalie wasn't good. Our back four weren't good. Um, yeah, there was nothing good about Liverpool when you take the front players out of it. The rest of the team, nah, not good for me at all. Um, but listen, that's the Premier League. That's the beauty of it. Aston Villa go to United beat them. I've always said, look, Sol- Solskjaer, he's never, United aren't winning any trophies or league titles with him as a manager. I wonder how long it will take them to do anything about that. I think they're very comfortable. I think as long as they make the Champions League, I think they've got a manager that politically is perfect for them. He's not going to give them any hassle. He's not going to demand players like Mourinho would, not like Van Gaal would. He's going to play the press line very well. He's a company man. Um, and I think, you know what, the Glazers, if he finishes third, fourth, gets in the odd cup final, very happy. For me, when you're bringing in the quality of player they brought in, Ronaldo, Sancho, Varane, you've got to be winning league titles. I said this all along, you know, you put Klopp in charge of United's team, or Guardiola in charge of that team, they, they are Tuchel, cool. they're winning the title by 10 points, in my opinion. So, um, you, you, you know, no surprise, they've had a couple of iffy results. This is what they do under Solskjaer. So, you know, good, but not nearly good enough. Um, is the best way to describe Man United. So Klopp's just a miracle worker. He'll keep Liverpool in the race till March or April. Again, the only thing killing them is injuries. You know, they've lost now three central midfielders. They never replaced one of in the market. Again, bad ownership, not supporting a manager. And now they've lost, I think, they obviously lost the uh, Elliot. They've lost Thiago. They've lost who else in there? Um, I think they have three or four injuries in central midfield. So they're one more injury. Oh, Keita has gone again as usual because he's made a glass. So you know, if they lost Jordan Henderson or Fabinho, who both have history for going down and patches during the season, Liverpool are playing a central midfield, I think, with James Milner uh, and Curtis Jones. That's not it's winning like league titles. Same problem, different position from last season. Co- co- correct. So that that is a concern, you know. But um, yeah, Premier League's looking good. I'll tell you who's 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 having a wobble and surprise me is Leicester. The results haven't been good. Um, I don't know if Brendan's getting any hassle from their fans, but like they're 
Yeah, they're, they're having a little bit of a wobble. I think if you look at four or five games, some of the results, uh, Burnley again on Saturday was 2-2. So, yeah, not as good as I thought they'd be. I think Barnes and Madison aren't playing well. So there's a bit of criticism coming in there for them. Um, Arsenal, fair play to Arteta. He was under a lot of pressure. And they've now bounced back um, with some good wins. Um, absolutely decimated Tottenham inside of, what, 36 minutes yesterday. So that that, that game was pretty much over before half time. Um, and let's see how long Nuno lasts at Spurs because I'm not sure Levy's patience will go much later. Because I said this before, if you have a manager who's pragmatic and plays a certain way, he has to get results because your fans will demand it. Because if you don't get results and you're sliding down the table and you're playing that pragmatic, boring shit football, your fans won't have it. And they won the first three games. They got top of the table. Okay, fine. Now they've had a slide. Now you're starting to see it. You could ask the Wolves fans about them. Probably very happy to be top 10, 12. And after two seasons of that, they actually said, well, actually, we want something different. That kind of, t- that tells you the story. So that that is a concern. I mean, you know what I mean? You, you've got that whiff of Antonio Conte hanging around like a bad smell at the moment for United, for Arsenal, for potentially Spurs. There's a top-class manager who's just won the league, went into Milan. He's taking time off and he's ready to step in and walk over someone's grave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Don't be shocked if he goes to Barcelona. You know what I mean? Because obviously Koeman's under a lot of pressure. Barcelona are going to be chopping and changing managers for the next five years every few weeks, aren't they? Unfortunately, they haven't got the money to fire managers at the moment. But, you know, don't don't be surprised if Conte's in there by January. So, um, uh, you know, he is... If you're looking for a top-tier manager out of work, he's as good as it gets, I suppose, isn't he, right now? Um, you know, <laughs> I imagine there's going to be a job going free in Glasgow sometime soon as well, by the looks of Celtic stats. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, wow. I mean, they are poor, aren't they? I mean, I, I, I've got to be honest, I didn't know a lot about the manager who came in. Mm-hmm. I know he's Australian. Um, yeah, I didn't know too much about him. But obviously, he's taken on a hell of a job there, and they've, they've brought a lot of new players in, a lot of players, but their results are shite. I mean, I'm a Celtic fan. Yeah, so you, you, I don't care how much new players you've got coming in or players going out. You, you cannot be as shit as they are at the moment. That's no excuse um, for a Celtic manager. Absolutely no way. So Neil Lennon, I never overly rated, but him and his worst day still had them up there in second place, still you know, you know within 10 points of you know margin of winning the title. But you, you, there's no way they're winning the title, is there? No, and the other one to call out was Brighton. Brighton now in sixth. Mm. Um, which another, you know, looking at, yes, I'm looking further back, but I saw a, a table tweeted of, you know, Brighton bottom of league, of division three as it was at the time, but basically bottom of the pile. Great, great ownership. Great infrastructure. Unbelievable training ground. Brilliant for men and women's football. What they've got in Potter is somebody who has finally unlocked the door for scoring goals. Because if you looked at Brighton statistically, very strong defensively, couldn't take their chances. Like, couldn't hit a barn door. And all they were missing was someone to take their chances. Like, for example, over the last two seasons, if Harry Kane had been in Brighton's team, they'd have finished top six each season. Such were the chances they were creating, such was how strong they are defensively. Um, Potter plays football the right way. He's obviously a very good manager. He showed that in Sweden. He showed it at Swansea. Um, and now, obviously, his work's paying off. And the difference now is they're converting probably 40% more than they were last year in chances for goals. And yeah, they're, 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 you know what? I, I like the Blooms who own Brighton. I'm really happy because I think there's some of the good guys out there. Uh, we have a lot of ex-posh at the club, Dan Ashford, a lot of people behind the scenes, right from youth all the way to the top. And uh, yeah, I, I, I like Brighton. And I, I, I'd love Liverpool to have a couple of their players, particularly the boy in midfield, Usaka or whatever. Is, is that, did I pronounce that right? Um, absolutely made for Liverpool. Um, now, coming into the championship, we talked obviously about uh, your results. Um, Reading. So, Reading now could be set for a 6 to 12 point deduction for financial mismanagement. What have you heard about that one? Just what you've just said there. Yeah. I don't really know anything going on behind the scenes. I don't know who's in the red list, who's in trouble, who's 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 obviously been charged by the EFL. Um Obviously, there's a lot of teams with broken financial fair play. There are there are penalties to pay. I don't know how some of them have done it. I mean, obviously, they've overspent massively. Um, we try and be the good guys and try and do things the right way uh, at our club. 
Uh, I know Wickham were, 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 I think, threatening to sue the EFL and stuff. <laughs> did I, make I me always chuckle. have a bright smile when I see that. <laughs> it, did, it did make me chuckle um, <laughs> about, about, you know, what happened to them or whatever else. Well, boo-hoo. Um, but, you know, a derby have had enough shit heaped on them, I think. So yeah. the last thing they need is that to happen. So my advice to Wickham is, you know, go and win a promotion the right way and do it yeah. over 46 games. Um so um, it is what it is. I, I, I don't want to stay in the championship because someone gets penalized points. Right. Um, I want to stay in merit. I want to hit points targets. I want to do well. Um, so I don't like seeing what's going on with Reading or, or, or Derby or anyone else. So it's like the murky side of the game. And when we look at the table, I mean, Hull struggling as well. Um, is that just a matter of finding the feet as well in the championship? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, like I said, Blackpool had a terrific start. And they've suddenly snapped in some good results. They found some defensive solidity. They got clean sheets. I think Grant's having the same issues we are. Probably a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, you, you know, Swansea had a pretty bad start, but they got a good result at the weekend. Huddersfield, who who done well to start with, and now a couple of rocky results. So, you know, it's the championship. I think three, four wins takes you on the verge of the playoffs. Three, four losses, and it's like the end of the world in League One. Um, it is that league. It's It's a brilliant league. And, you know, looking at Coventry the other night, you know, whatever else, they're a good team. How far can they go? I don't know. And Barnsley showed last year you can go far. Um, so we'll see. Um, it's going to be exciting. I mean, Fulham have had a few slip-ups. Bournemouth seems to be really, really solid. So Scott Park has done a really, really good job there. Um, who else is up there? I think mean, Cardiff got fucking demolished, didn't they, oh, the yeah, weekend? Black, Blackburn got five plus. Uh, mm-hmm. you got streaky Stoke, Blackburn. Stoke in fifth. Mm-hmm. Uh, who beat Hull, um, and then you're going down to Bristol City, and actually Reading. I mean, I'm surprised that Reading are up there in ninth. I know it's again early doors, but um, they didn't start too well, so it just shows what a couple of results. Well, we, we, listen, we, results we set them off. We set them yeah. off. They couldn't buy a fucking win till they played us, and then you know, three minutes of madness, and suddenly Reading are knocking on the door to play off. So. You, you know, a lot of teams look at Posh and go, right, that's, that's going to get us going for the season. For fuck's sake. You, need, you need some more interest <laughs> rug, inter- squad training games sorted. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, no, so the champ's interesting. League One's taking shape. Obviously, Sunderland and uh, Wigan are looking pretty yeah. uh, pretty dominant in that league. Um, any surprises for you this weekend in League One? Uh, let's have a look down the results here. Uh, I mean, I'm continued to be surprised by Charlton struggling. He's Charlton got to be under pressure. Look- He's got to yeah, be under pressure soon. You got Ipswich and Charlton still in the bottom four again. Did you did you did you see Ipswich's goal in the ninety whatever minute? The goalkeeper, right? So the goalie, it's uh, Wednesday one 0 up. The goalie's got the balls. The 89th and 90th minute. The Ipswich players hiding behind them. Right, right. And I'm thinking the goalie, you got to look around. The goalie puts it on the floor. Mm-hmm. Player nicks it. There's a bit of a melee, and then it goes back, and then obviously it gets put in. But you're thinking, like, I, I, I'd want to strangle my goalkeeper. Like, you know, 90th minute, you're 1-0 up. You know, it's a, it's a hell of a fucking win, yeah. a result. And then, like, bosh. I mean, you just want to throttle the guy. <laughs> you know I have to like, check that out. It sounds like oh, the Forest guy back in the 90s. Yes, uh, yes, correct. But was that disallowed? No, I think... Didn't he, it, didn't he head it out of the goalkeeper's hands? Yeah. I mean, that was Crosby. Andy Dibble, wasn't it? I, yeah. It shows it how far back we're going now. Yeah, yeah. Dibble's one of my old goalie coaches. But this was worse. The goalie actually put it down on the ground. Right. And the player's like one foot behind him. He's just now, daydreaming. But it went on for like 10 seconds. Before he put it down, you could see the Ipswich player hiding behind him. And I'm thinking, what about the other 10 Sheffield Wednesday players? <laughs> yeah, you give him a shout. Why, why aren't they screaming at him? Like, mm-hmm. behind you, behind you, behind you. Oh, couldn't couldn't understand it. Who else had a good result in there? Um, um, there was uh, let's see, Shrewsbury beating AFC Wimbledon. Plymouth uh, did well again, riding Plymouth high. Beat Doncaster, yeah. Doncaster yeah. have been struggling. Yeah, Doncaster bottom, aren't they right now? Yeah, they're not good. Yeah, um, we talked about Sunderland and Wigan both getting wins. So I don't know if there's any big surprises this week. Um, in the uh, in League One particularly, but like you say, it's taking shape. MK Dons third place, eighteen points. And I did say, I did well. say, yeah, MK yeah. Dons were my tip, weren't they? So obviously they lost their manager, but they've they've adapted well. And um, Plymouth, brilliant. Uh, I love Lowy. Uh, he rang me on deadline day um, about a player and to get some advice, and we had a great chat. And you know, he's a really really good manager. So mm-hmm. he's got a good group of lads there. Uh, we've got Ryan Broom there doing really well. The Plymouth fans are trying to played mind games with me saying he's crap and whatever else. So, you know, I won't be charging him the gold bullions in January. 
um, to buy him. He's just on loan, <laughs> is he, right now? Yeah, they have an option to buy him. Um, well, they have an option to match whatever we get from him. But if okay. we if we get a bid from a club, we can pull him back and sell him. Yeah. So my advice to them would be, like we told him, I told Lowy at the time, buy him then. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, but listen, he's done well. So I imagine there'll be a few suitors for him in January. So, yeah, fair play to him. And then down in League Two, uh, Forest Green continue to... Uh... Um, well, I don't want to say walk away because nobody walks away with anything after nine games. No. So, who, surpri uh, who surprised you that's doing really crap in League Two? Um, Mansfield. Mm. Mansfield, Salford. Yeah. I mean, I mean Salford the 19th, Mansfield the 20th right now. Car Caroline and John, you know, must be pulling their fucking hair out of Mansfield. Um, you know, they're owners, I know. And they always, like, put up, you know, the dough. They always, like, you know, back. I think David Sharp, the ex-Wigan guy, is now in there doing all the recruitment yeah. and stuff. They got Nigel Clough. On the face of it, you think it's a good setup. I'm, I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, but you'd always fancy them to be one of the clubs, but it just hasn't happened. It's it's, it's bizarre for me. I don't know what's going on there. And year after year, mm. you know, every year you think this time is going to be different. For yeah, them because yeah. Last year must just be an anomaly, and yeah. then they he's got to be under pressure now. I mean, he's got. Mm -hmm. I mean. Let's talk about the sack race. You know, who yeah. are the top five candidates in the three leagues to lose their jobs? Come on, Phil, throw some names at me. Would you would you would you put Derek in there if you lose another couple of games? No, I think uh Anger and Aya will be directed elsewhere. <laughs> and, uh, the owner's gonna Derek. get it. Yeah, but if the owner's gonna get it, you know, he's gonna the best best way to distract the fans is get rid of the manager. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um so this will I mean, I look at the table, you think of in League One, Charlton, Doncaster. Mm. No, yeah, I, 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 no, the Doncaster, look, they, they haven't given him any backing financially, yeah. so I don't think, he, you know, it would be fair to Isn't fire him. But you, No, you're probably right. He's probably in the firing line. Where's Portsmouth now in that league? Portsmouth are, uh, let's have a look. They're 10th, so they're not doing too bad now. Right, so they're a couple of wins from being okay. Um getting up there I'm just trying to think Ipswich Ipswich still struggling they're not high in the league are they? No, but I mean like, I'd imagine they're going to give him some time well I would imagine yeah if he's not if he's not top seven by the end of November I would imagine he could be in trouble mm. um, so I would say in league two cloffy has got to be up there in the sack race yeah. um, the Salford so manager cross Gary Boyer. yeah he's definitely got to be in the firing line my old pal you know, we've talked, talked <laughs> get the, about him yeah, um, I know I've lost, but you talk about pragmatic football not working. Mm. I mean, that's the epitome of pragmatic football not working. 100%. So I can't exactly. imagine they'll be sticking where, Where's, where's Rotherham in League One? Rotherham aren't doing too bad. They're fifth. Yeah, right they, now. yeah that, that's fine. Because I know. But, you know, when you look at League One, I think of Darren Moore at Sheffield Wednesday. Where, where are they at the moment? They're 11th at the moment. <laughs> yeah, they, they started well and then they've kind mm -hmm. of rolled off. Yeah, you're absolutely right, which surprised me. I thought Darren Moore would kill it there. Um, but, yeah, but you know, like you said, with us, three points off uh, automatic spots. I mean, we're still talking Sheffield Wednesday eleventh, but they win there in the playoff spots. No, November's your your danger month. Like for mm -hmm. any manager, November is like you've got to start turning things around because November coming up to Christmas is like when you know shit. This is when you're losing your job, unless you are miles at the bottom of the league and like you're way off. Of it. Right. So I, I would imagine, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the average statistics are, but it's got to be, I'd say, November, December have got to be the heavy months for, like, getting rid of people. Now, now it's often, you know, touted that, oh, wait, 10, 10 games until the um, the tables start to, you know, before you take interest of the tables. I mean, is that fair on the inside of football? Or is that just something we all tell ourselves not to get too excited or too depressed? Yeah, I mean, I, you know me. I'm, I, I don't really pay attention to where we are on the table until February, March. You know, unless you're 20 points out of it and you're miles away, do you know what I mean? But I've, I've never, I've always said that even last year, I never got excited about being first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. It didn't matter. Like, it only mattered in the last kind of 12 games, key, the key run-in, particularly if you're, like, aimed for promotion. Um, so people obsess about tables. I guess, forget tables, it's performances. If you if you watch your team for four or five games, they never look like, you know, winning. and never look like goal scoring. That's a concern. Because then you've got a decision. Do you... Do you back your manager or do you change your manager? Do you get rid of the team, you know, and, and back the manager? So there are all those things that fall into place. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I know some fans will moan about our manager and, you know, does he get criticised for losing away and for mistakes? We have a brilliant, brilliant set of manager, manager coaches all the way through. You know, last week, our 16s, our 18s, our 23s, our first team, 
you know, everything's in sync really well. And, um, you know, like my manager, I'll be giving him a new contract, you know what I mean, quite shortly, do you know what I mean? Because his, his contract's running down and stuff like that. So that's, that's never even been a question for me and my partners. We're fully on board with what we're trying to do, you know, and, and it's not that our manager doesn't feel pressure because he's got pride in what he does. He wants to do well at this level, you know. But it'll be interesting to see what happens November, December for other clubs and see, like, when does it start? Or will COVID give managers a little bit of a respite because clubs can't afford to fire people? Now, when you look across your peers, uh, mm. your fellow owners, obviously they're the people who are making these decisions. Like, how many of them really understand football? I mean, this is a loaded question a little bit, but are they looking at the the stats and they're looking at it and see, oh, well, this is just what we're missing, or you know, you can't necessarily blame the manager for this or whatever. Or are they just looking at the league table? I think some of them look at league tables. I think some of them miss in the fans. I think some of them want to distract from their own poor performance of lack of back in the manager. Um, there'd be a lot of that going on. Look, there's a lot of good owners in our league, but there's a lot of fucking shocking owners as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's really half and half, I'd say, at this stage. Um, it'd be interesting to see. Like I said to you, November will be like the red wedding in, in Game of Thrones. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there will be, usually there are sackings. But So I guess it's maybe too early to talk about the sack race at the moment, Philip. We're going to give well, them another are there, six weeks. Are there, put, are there managers already lining up waiting? I mean, we talked about Conte in the Premier League. Yes, yes, yes. There are managers basically who, you know, some good managers, I would imagine, they'll be on the sidelines waiting, um, you know what I mean, for some jobs that come up. And there'll be also managers I know personally who will be in jobs at the moment who are like dying to get away and get better jobs. You know what I mean? So there'll be a bit of that going on as well. Um, so be interesting. Now, those managers that are out of a job who are kind of jonesing, waiting for an opportunity, are they already looking at that league table and saying, you know oh, what, yeah. I'm going to start uh, getting in the ear of the Doncaster owner or the, whatever that no, might be? No, there, there, there'll be managers who will start showing up to games towards yeah. the end of October, November. We'll start putting their faces out there. We'll start trying to get on Sky. And look, a couple of the Sky football shows could do with some change of like personnel and stuff for the commentaries, do you know what I mean? Like, so I would imagine... They'll be out there. They'll put themselves out there. They'll be in the studios. It'll be interesting. Particularly as some bigger jobs, like if the Charlton job became available, it's a hell of a job. Sheffield yeah. Wednesday job became available, hell of a job. So, you, you, you know, yes, there will be. Even if the Mansfield job became available, it's mm-hmm. a good job. Yeah, so, I mean, As we said, you got money to spend. 100%. So it'd be interesting, you know. Like I said, it's, it's like COVID's caused this football recession. I'm just wondering, will it be a knock-on into the managers and jobs? keeping jobs, you know, uh, yeah, not being able to afford to sack them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there'll be a bit of that going on. Like, it was interesting yeah. to read that Swansea had retained Steve Cooper's uh, contract. Mm-hmm. We're paying him still. So they got compensation when he got the Forest job. Yeah. So, you know, okay, interesting. It's good. So we got some other topics um, I want to touch on. First of all, um, Rick Parry has been talking about uh, parachute payments again. And uh, the split between the Premier League and the EFL in TV rights, suggesting that 25% of the income should go to the EFL, uh, which would mean no need for parachute payments. Um, where do you stand on parachute payments? Um, I fundamentally agree that there's not enough money going into the football league. I've always argued that. The fact that the champ got 12, League 1, 8, you know, League 2, 6% or whatever else. So isn't it, there's too much difference between League 1 and the champ. You can see that just with the teams and the budgets. Never mind the difference between the Prem. I think there should be an element of parachute payments for all the leagues, definitely. You can't just do away with that. You can't come down from the Prem and you've got all these players and these big wages and suddenly expect teams to be able to afford to stay in the, in the champ. You're going to have clubs going bankrupt. You know what I mean? Unless you brought rules in where every contract the player signed in the Premier League, no matter who the club is, if you brought a rule in and said straight away, there's a 50% pay cut in, league, in, in the champ, there's a 70% pay cut for League One, thus protecting the financials of a club. If you could do that and whatever else, okay, maybe you can do away with parachute payments. Um, but if you don't do that, there has to be some parachute element. I'm not sure I agree with it. I think it's four years now that you get X amount of money. And, and I think someone said the other day, there was something like six or seven clubs currently in the champ still getting the benefit one way or another of parachute money. Um, that doesn't work. That doesn't make it a good league as regards to competition. Um, so Parry's right. Um, I, have, I have a lot of time for Rick. I was very angry with him over the voting situation. But I think he's a good guy. I think his heart's in the right place. I think he's trying to do the right thing for our league. 
Um, it would be very interesting if what he said there happened. Twenty five percent went to us. No parachute money. You know, he capped the wages coming down. It would be interesting to see what the leagues would be like. Our fear has always been. That's why we want to get in the champ was. If the champ broke away and became Prem 2 and closed the doors, you know, to the other leagues, you'd want to be in the champ when that happens, if that, for some horrible reason, did happen. I mean, I saw Guardiola was bitching and moaning last week about when they played Wickham in the Cup that, you know, he wanted his young players to play Wickham every week. Well, you know, again, like, fuck's sake almighty. Well, that's great. Well, stop putting young teenagers on 50 grand a fucking week them. Because we'd all be happy to take Man City players on loan, but I know more than anyone trying to get those players in the summer, it's financially impossible. So what do you want, pal? Do you want your players playing every week against Wickham or in the champ or whatever else? Or do you want to be charging clubs like Peter United 12 grand or 14 grand a week for a player? But, you know, people might read that as controversial. I'm taking a dig at Man City, but that's just the truth. You can't have it both ways. And we keep saying that. Like, we approach these clubs in the summer about certain players. You know, it wasn't just them. It was other Prem clubs. I told you, it was a 19-year-old on 50 grand a week. And the club said to us, don't worry, we'll let you have them for half. And we were like, half? That's like 1.3 million pounds. That would be like 30% of our wage bill on one fucking 19-year-old who's never played in the football league. How is that even, how is that feasible? How is that even possible? Like, behave. Um, so you can't have a both ways. And, I, and he needs to stop with that. He needs to stop saying, you know, because it's like implying the B team thing. He wants like Man City to the B team, and like you just wind people up, stop with it, because it's just not going to happen. So someone needs to have a word with him politely and go, "Pep, stop." Is it? Does he ha- does he carry any influence at all? No, I think he just pisses people off. Um, I, if he was speaking in Spain, they might listen. They already have B teams there, and yeah, whilst he's the greatest manager in the in the league currently, and he is, he's the the, the best manager out there. Um, no, he, his words don't make us all want to vote to decide to bring Man City B team in to League One or League Two or non-league or wherever. So so I don't know why he keeps saying it. I'd rather he came out and said, we enjoyed playing Wickham. I want some of my players to go to Wickham and play with that legendary striker I can find why. And I want our players to go for free. And I want Man City to pay for their accommodation. And I want to put three of our players in Gareth Ainsworth's team to play with that legendary striker. And we're going to do that for 12 months for free. That's what I wanted to say in an interview. Yeah, because that experience because, is invaluable. Because I know the three players will play 50 games in a Wickham team for the next nine, 10 months. And we're happy to foot the bill for that because the development that will happen. Just like when Ben White came to us for a year, then he went to Leeds for a year, enabled Brighton to develop him so that he's worth 50 million, which allowed them to take 50 million to put into their squad and make them a top 10 Premier League team. Guess yep. who all played a part in that? The EFL. Yep. So, Daniel Levy, we talked about him a little bit earlier uh, and his patience. He's put a three and a half billion, I don't want to say price tag, but more of a valuation on Spurs. Sure. Um, does that sound a fair amount? Yeah, that'd be about right. I, well, I, I, w- I would put them more in the two million mark, two billion mark, sorry. Um, but you got their stadium was a billion quid, wasn't it? So, if you take everything into account, they're a top tier London club. Um, they have crowds now of 60,000. They've probably got turnover now of, I don't know, three, four hundred million a year now. The new stadium's kicked in. You have to look at it after COVID's passed. The events they can hold, the NFL games, the money they can bring in. Spurs is a worldwide brand. A fair valuation would be anywhere between 2.2 and 2.9 billion. I'm not sure they're at the three and a half billion level. Um, there aren't many clubs at that level. You know what I mean? So if you go by NFL valuations, you got the Cowboys are five billion, you got the Patriots are four billion. But you got to understand their their TV deals, their stadiums. There's a lot more value in those things. So maybe after the next TV deal, post COVID, three four years down the line, maybe when we finally have, well, I've always said Netflix is a good idea for football. When that comes into play, you will have valuations of the top clubs being worth three three billion north of. So yeah, there you go. Why was he looking to sell it? Was that why he put the valuation on? I'm not sure. I think he's just talking about how much he thinks his value is. Um, you know, the interesting thing is we've got all, all these top clubs like Aston and United that want want new owners who are always looking for new owners. Do price tags like that put off? Like, are there buyers in the market for top clubs at those kind of price tags? Yeah, I mean, I you know, in America, when someone buys an NFL team, it's usually, you know, a tech geek who's come good. He's never, you know, he's, he's like a 50-year-old virgin 
who suddenly decides, well, you know, I've worked all my life and I've suddenly made like 30 billion, 40 billion. Mm-hmm. I'm going to buy an NFL team. So I'm spend five like, more billion to put down. Yeah, my, well, you know, well, usually the, the average price recently in the recent acquisitions has been 2.6, 2.4 billion because you can't get the Dallas Cowboys. You can't get the Patriots. They're, they're just top tier. They're not for sale. But you can buy a Carolina Panthers for 2.4 billion. You can buy a Jacksonville for 1.8 billion. So, you know, you could do that. You know, like you could buy a Burnley for 180 million. Yeah. You know, I dare say you buy a Newcastle for 400 million which always makes me laugh because if you're valuing other clubs at like 2 billion, you know, how's Newcastle got such a low valuation? Why is nobody mm-hmm. bought it? Because you got 55,000 fans every week. You got an unbelievable stadium. You got Geordie land in the Northeast is just like religious for football. It's got so much potential. I mean, that's got to be the biggest snip in the world right now for a football club. It's always just astonished, blown my mind. Nobody's given Ashley his three, 400 million. So, um, and he's got every right to ask for that. Um, so I don't know. It, it depends on future TV deals. You know, the next two years will be interesting because it's all about post-COVID financially for a lot of these things. Same for us in, in our league. But you're always in the back of your mind worried that that fucking wonderful government of, of Britain, you know, change their mind, shut everything down, you know, do things like fucking dopey fuck face Biden's done. You know, you're always worried at any time things like that can happen and just blow up everything financially. So right now everyone's worried about petrol in the car to get to a game. So I guess you know that we'll be dealing with that next over here. I guess. Oh uh, yeah, I'm waiting. <laughs> F- fill up all the jerry cans. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it, isn't it? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, valuation wise, look, it's like what's your club worth? Whatever someone's willing to pay. Mm-hmm. Like someone asked me what posh are worth, and I give valuations, and people laugh, but they don't realise. Well, uh, one player of ours for me is worth twenty million plus, and that's young Ronnie Edwards. Yeah. Yeah. So straight away, you know, if someone's asked me the valuation of Posh, I'm going north of 30 million. Why do I say that? Because I know in January or in next summer, if I wanted to sell three, four players, that's what I could raise. Mm-hmm. So why would I sell the club for less? Yeah. So, you, you, you know, that's, that's the reality. We've got no debts, you know. But what we do have is we have player assets. Some would say depreciate, and I would say appreciating, as in a Ronnie Edwards and some of the younger players. So we've got millions and millions in assets. Spurs would look, well, Man United would look at it or Man City and go, well, if you add up the value of our squad, we've probably got seven, 800 million out there on the pitch. Do you know what I mean? So th- this is when the market's good. We're not in a right. recession, a football recession. So valuation is always interesting. Like, what would you value Bradford at? If I were a free agent and I wanted to buy Bradford, mm-hmm. what would I have to pay? Yeah, well, what you would have to pay versus what the valuation is maybe two different things. But yeah, I correct. Mean, I mean, the challenge for a team like Bradford is you got no assets, you don't own your training ground, you don't own your stadium, yeah. you don't have a lot of playing assets because most mm-hmm. of them are older players on yeah. you know, those depreciating assets versus appreciating. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're probably looking at based on the kids that we do have that resale value, the golden share, two or three million, maybe. Wow. You know? And, um, I mean, I don't think the owner's willing to sell for that. So No, of course, he'd probably want, he'd probably want three times that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, yeah, of course. So, so yeah, it's like everything else. You know, I, I, you know, you can buy one of the, the, the smaller clubs in League 2 for, I guess, three, four million. I know some of those deals yeah. have been done recently. So, yeah. your Bradford owner would argue, well, Bradford's a sleeping giant. It's this, yeah. it's that, whatever. But the answer... Potential. Yeah, the answer back would be like you said, well, okay, well, what am I buying? I'm not buying a training ground. I'm not buying a stadium. I'm, I'm not buying a squad that sold players for any significant money in the last 10 years. Um, what am I buying? Um, because the first thing I'd have to do when I go in there is I'd have to put a whole new squad in. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd have to, you know, do a lot of things. So so there's always that. But it's like I said to you, it's whatever someone wants. It's not about yeah. what you think it's worth or what I think it's worth. And who it's, sees the opportunity and what they think they can make of that opportunity. Yeah, okay. Correct. Correct. So, so that, that's it. You know, that's a fascinating thing about football clubs, you know, for sale and, and what are all the figures, you know? So last uh, question I want to get in before we go to a couple of listener questions. Sure. Uh, Henry has, has found a way to get Bolton. Producer Henry has found a way to get a Bolton question in. Um, he says that Bolton has banned betting stands at mm-hmm. the stadium and won't be getting into commercial partnership with gambling companies. Uh, Henry's asking, you know, is that brave? Is that losing out on income? How do you see this kind of move away from... Do you want, do you want, do you want my truthful answer? Hard mm-hmm. truth on this? I don't do virtue signaling. You know I don't. Yeah. Um, I'd have respected the decision more if when they were in administration and they owed loads of people money and they hadn't paid players' wages, they came out and made that decision then and said, you know what? This is the way forward for the club and this is what we're going to do. Listen, each to their own. 
I can't be overcritical because I can't criticise how other people run the club. And they've done a great job, the owners of Bolton, since they've gone in. They've, they've, they've brought them back from League 2 to League 1. They're a really well put together football team. They've got a really good manager. I don't know financially how they're doing, but I presume they're doing okay. And they're obviously servicing all the, the commitments they had when they took over after the mess they came before. Um, I'm not a fan of all of that. I, 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 we live in a world where it's constantly people, and this isn't a dig of bolt, and it's, it's just they want to take things away from you. They want to take your freedom of choice away. I see the press go on about it. No, gambling this and gambling that. And we shouldn't be doing this and we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, Sky Bet are like the biggest sponsor in our league. And, and you, you, you know, it's not illegal to gamble. I get what they're saying, that it causes addiction and there are people who lose their livelihoods and lose their lives. And, but they all have a choice. I have a choice. I have a choice to take a drink, not take a drink. To, and I've got an addictive personality. So do I gamble? Not overly, because I know my own personality. If I did it too much, I'd be in too deep. Drink too much, I'm going to drink too much. Do you know what I mean? So, so I choose me to move away. I don't blame sports for throwing it on TV. I don't blame the Super Bowl for every time a Budweiser advert comes on. Do you know what I mean? So, so I kind of take ownership of my choice, my decision. So for everyone out there to virtue signal and go, it's the right thing to do, and we shouldn't sign sponsors with you know, the devil, i.e. betting companies and this, that, whatever else. I've said it before. I don't care if it's a dildo company that gives me 20 million a year for the naming rights on my new stadium. At the end of the day, my job, first and foremost, is to make sure the lights are on on our football ground, that I can pay my staff, that in this horrible time financially for football clubs, we have the income necessary to keep going. That's my job, first and foremost, and that's my responsibility to our fans. Some will say, well, your responsibility to your fans is make sure they don't get addicted to gambling. They don't get that. No, no, no. I run a business. I don't run a charity. I don't run a foundation. That's separate from our football. I run a business. And our business is based on turnover, income, and expenditure. And if some legal company wants to give us copious amounts of money to help us improve our facilities, put more money into our community, improve everything about us as a football club in the city, I'm going to take the money. And I know that's not going to sound popular and all these journalists who go on and on about it and all these people out there, whatever else. And, and I sound like the, the devil even saying that. Well, you don't own a football club. You don't know what you're fucking talking about. You just write about it. So that's my opinion. You do you and I'll do me. So if that's what Bolton want to do, fair fucking play. All right. You can only protect folks so much at the end of the day. Phil, you're, you're a crying lib, so you probably yeah. agree with all of this. So I'm going to ask you the question. If Bradford get offered $10 million a year, you know, by Bet Fred or by Paddy mm -hmm. Power or Bet365, and let's say you're a shareholder in Bradford, yeah. I want you to answer really honestly here in your children's lives. Are you turning that money down? Of course not. You know, Correct. I mean, I'm a capitalist first before I live, for one yeah. thing. But, but two, I mean... If I... Donald Trump said he wants mm -hmm. his name on your shirts... And he's paying you ten million a year, even though it would upset your wife every day to see it on the shirts. You're gonna take the money. Yeah, I might not buy a shirt, but I you're gonna take to the money. Promoted. You're gonna take the money. Of course you are. So, so look, fair play to them at Bolton. Maybe the owners have a personal thing to do with this. Maybe something happened with their family, whatever. I can't, you know, uh, criticize that or have a go at that. Like I said, that's their call, their decision. I mean, you, you know, do I think it merits headlines and whatever else? No, not really. Just like if we go and take a sponsorship deal from Bet365 or one of the big boys, I don't think it merits a bad article. Just like I don't think it merits a great article when you decide to drop uh, uh, bookies and stuff. I'm going to come with uh, a couple of questions for you, Dara, that we've got from listeners this week. First of all, Sam uh, sent us an email asking if you could share some insights into the average kind of income that clubs get from shirt sponsors uh, and how, perhaps how that differs across the different four leagues. So when I, when I bought Posh, we were getting 20 grand a year and we had a two year shirt deal. So I bought the, the, the deal out because obviously I wanted my company to sponsor the shirt. We did the biggest shirt sponsorship deal in history of football. I think it was like a 3 million quid deal. But even back then I thought 20 grand a year was taking the piss. It wasn't enough. So we now have a terrific commercial department. Alex and Horace do a great job running that department. And I think our, I want to say we get near enough quarter of a million pounds a year now for our shirt. Um, and not only did we do just the front, we also have a sponsor from the back. So we've monetized so many areas. Like our commercial is on fire. It's done really well. Now we have digital boards around the ground. 
there's so many things changing about how we bring money in commercially. So, yeah, shirt deals. League one, you're, league two, you probably say 100 grand a year, 70 to 100 grand. League one, depending on size of club, league one would be, again, one to 150. And then champ, up, champ would be 200 up to a million. Because, again, you could have, like, a Newcastle in the championship, do you know what I mean, whatever. And then you go up to the Premier League and you'd be getting seven figures. Like, I dare say, if we were you know, top tier championship and established ourselves. We'd have a betting company. I'm being, <laughs> I'm laughing about a previous segment who would offer us probably a million quid a year. In yeah. fact, I'm out there saying to betting companies, if you want to come, you know, of our shirts sure running million. out, <laughs> offer us a million. I'll drop my drawers. <laughs> like I said, you know, money talks and bullshit walks. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there you go. That's the answer to that question. Yeah. And you, you see, um, you know, it's not just, the shirt sponsorship now you have training all the training gear gets sponsored and um you know anything that will work basically yeah absolutely yeah well our training gear we have a kit sponsor we even have a sponsor for our training ground our training academy is named by somebody you know we have a, a, a sponsor for the stadium and we have a sponsor for stands individually mm-hmm. i mean next is going to be sponsoring my car sponsoring you know you know I'm not sure Bentley will pay me, you know, to drive the car around, <laughs> but I'd like them to. Um, but yeah, you Bentley I mean, is sponsored yeah. by the local Ford dealership. <laughs> true, true. Well, actually, Mercedes used to do me a great deal for the car we got for the, from the club, so I got to get Bentley to do the same now. I got some new wheels. Uh, I thought it was good to upgrade in the champ, but uh, and I mean, I mean, you, you laugh about it, but I'd said to the commercial department we were having a bit of a brainstorm, and I came up with the idea about our Twitter account, like our social media should be sponsored, and we ended up getting like ten grand. For mm-hmm. somebody putting their name over our social media account. How many football clubs do that in a social media right. account? You know, so you've always got to think outside the box. Just like yeah, we're always asking for sponsors for our podcast. Yeah. Nobody nobody seems to be brave enough because it would be easy money if you're trying to sell something to football fans or sports fans. And it's it's really frustrating because we obviously have had over nearly I think we're up to nearly half a million listeners now. Uh, we've had since we started. Yeah. So we should be we should be getting some good sponsors in there. <laughs> Plug for sp- contact at hardtruthfootball.com. Correct. Tell me if you're a betting company. Get in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Connor asks on email, with the striker problem that Posh have uh, really? right now, could the club delve into the emergency loan market? Now, is there even such a thing as the emergency loan market anymore? There's no loan market. Connor needs to read up on the rules. There's, <laughs> there's no getting loans in. There's, there's absolutely no loans, not allowed, not till January. So the answer is no. We can delve into the free signing market. Your problem there is you've got players who've been injured, had issues. That's why they haven't got clubs. Uh, They haven't played. It would take probably eight weeks to get a player right now in and get them fit. Yeah. And eight weeks from now, you're into nearly December. And by then, you know, we'll have Ricky J. Jones back. Uh, We'll have Joel Randall back. Um, Who else? Uh, You know, the only one missing, hopefully, would be Marriott. So... You know, at that stage, you're kind of like, well, what was the point? Particularly, mm-hmm. it was going to take them time to get up to scratch. So I'm going to end on, uh, we've been putting you to work to get some guests lined up for the show. Yes. So yes. where are we with that? So SJ, my good pal, Simon Jordan, I've been texting with him. Uh, he actually approached me a couple of weeks ago on a podcast and said that, you know, when me and him were on a Sky TV show a few years ago, he was astonished at how intelligent I was. And it kind of had him up as level. So he was taking a piss as usual, but he was being mm. honest as well. Because we had a bit of a to do on heart. Yeah, he does, yeah. And um, to be fair, he um, he said that he'll come on. So we're just trying to find time in the diary. I, was, I want to see how it impacts the, the viewership. Uh, yeah. He might want to replace you and be that undisputed me versus him, you know, on a podcast. It's a joke, Phil. I watch and, out for uh, my job. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, <laughs> it doesn't pay you anything. Um, so he, he's good, definitely going to come on. Uh, I'm working on Adrian Durham, obviously a big posh fan, but he's also a big talk sport icon. He's got a big following in the sports world, so I love AD to come on. At the moment, you know, he emails me all the time, and I always answer him. I email him one fucking request. He hasn't answered me. So uh, <laughs> yeah, he's obviously ducking and diving. Um, who else has agreed? Uh, Matt Letizia has agreed to come on. Again, got to figure out a time for that. Um, I want to get some owners on. I want to get some other football club owners on. I think someone in my shirt it because I think I'm going to, like, go at them. So, which I wouldn't, I would only bring them on to try and, um, you know, show people the other side of some owners. So what I really need is I need some good suggestions, you know, you know, from, from, um, from our listeners, I need some, like what people in football do you want me to get on? Like who would interest you? Yeah. And from an owner perspective, I think, you know, if you know your owner is somebody who is comfortable being public so because there's two sets of owners, right? There's owners if, that will if they're not, if they're not, but, but here's the thing, Phil, if they're not, here's the time to do it. 
I've always said some owners get a really, really hard time. And the only reason they do is because they don't put themselves out there. They don't let people see the real them. Like, I know some people fucking hate me. And I know some people respect me. And, and, and when they listen to me and, and we, we do things and we do press, whatever, they understand the method to my madness. And I think if more owners put themselves out there, to allow fans to see the real them and look I'm, I'm a real person i've got issues and i've tried to do this and i've fucked it up and you know i'm asking the fans to give me time i think they would get a lot more patience you know from the fans so so yeah if there's anyone out there listening that wants to suggest their owners to come on come at me with it and also come at your owners via your club accounts or social media or whatever else I'll, I'll be delighted to have any of them on so yeah interesting you know but we need more people in football on the show that's for sure all right well we let's wrap it up there Okie uh, dokie. Same place, same time, same place next week. Good Sounds like a plan. This week. Um, and you, pal, and you, and, and you. you. Um, anyone's got any questions, of course, keep those coming in at contact at hardtruthfootball.com or you can go to the website, hardtruthfootball.com slash contact. Either way, we'll get to producer Henry and I so we can add them to the list. Brilliant. Take care, everybody. Mm-hmm.